Welcome to Needham School Spotlight. I'm Dan Goodykant, Superintendent of Schools. Over the last year, the Needham Schools and staff have been busy working on an ambitious agenda outlined in the district's goals. Please join me today as key members of the district's administrative staff share with you highlights of the work we have accomplished and the challenges ahead. Welcome this morning to Ann Galati, Director of Administration and Finance, Terry Duggan, Director of Program Implementation, Tom Campbell, our Director of Human Resources, and Chris Brumbeck, our Director of Student Development. Thanks for being here. Terry, uh, one of the things that was a theme this past year, throughout the year in professional development, was the idea of 21st century learning. In fact, the professional development program pretty much was focused on uh, bringing folks in, thinking about uh, our workshops and conversations around 21st century skills and learning. Uh, can you, what did, that, uh, what did that look like and how did that relate to our goals? Well, um, our district goal, uh, our third district goal is really to promote active citizenship. And so in the spirit of citizenship for the 21st century, many of our, 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 our thinking, much of our thinking around this was to, in fact, uh, unpack the idea of what a 21st century citizen would look like, would, how would behave, what does that 21st century citizen need to know and be able to do. And in order to open that conversation up, we structured our professional day in November around this topic, which was an exciting way of um, creating a learning community for our faculty and staff about exploring new ideas about student learning and, and how students, uh, what things students need to be able to do in this um, new environment. <clears throat> so we looked at 21st century skills from, through the lens of technology, through the lens of environmental sustainability, through the lens of cultural competencies, and through the lens of service learning. How, do you be a, how, do you, how are you, in fact, contributing to your community? We scheduled a um, wonderful keynote speaker, Dr. Yang Zhao, who came in um, via teleconference to model the, tele model the technology that we have. Um, we're trying to demonstrate that learning can be any time, any place. So we modeled it for our staff through Dr. Yang Zhao's uh, keynote speech. And then we had a number of guest speakers come in from local universities and other school districts who talked to us about these various dimensions or lenses of um, 21st century skills. And then later on in the year, I mean, it wasn't just a, a uh, one, uh, uh, one day workshop. This was followed up with the staff and many of those presenters later on in the year. Yes, um, what we did was, in order to keep the discussions going and the momentum going around this, we scheduled our April early release day to um, pick up on the same theme. Many of our speakers who came to came and uh, presented in, in uh, November came back in April, and the teachers had an opportunity to explore another dimension or another lens at that point in time. Um, it, would be, uh, it would be fair to say that we don't have the answer to what 21st century learning is in the Indian public schools. Is this more of an exploratory uh, year, or, or what, what are next steps for us? Um, it definitely, it was an exploratory year, but we've also managed to think about what we wanted to do next. So that it was the impetus, the work from November and April was the impetus for many service learning projects that are taking shape at the various schools. Um, so that the idea of service learning started with a, a, a germinated and then grew. Um, we are looking at reshaping some of our professional development offerings to include these, these dimensions of the 21st century skills. So our new professional development program um, for the fall will include that. And we're running a 21st century tech camp. So that tech camp this summer will, in fact, incorporate many of these ideas as well. Well, I want to, tech camp relates to our technology program, and we'll get to that in just a little bit. But one of the themes, uh, Chris, that emerged and that you've been involved in related to uh, one of our goals is th this business of uh, social and emotional health. We heard a lot from Dr. Yang Zhao that uh, we need students to be creative, to be able to relate to one another, and, and uh, to be ambitious and really engaged in their learning. That has been a major theme and focus of the district for a while. What are some of the activities that have occurred with our uh, social and emotional development for students? Well, we know that social and emotional competence are key factors in children and adults being successful in their lives, either both their personal and their professional lives. The district has had a long-standing commitment to social and emotional competence. And our current, our current plan for the district includes four objectives that really focus on student competence, uh, teacher competence, helping parents develop competence in, uh, in 
parenting and, and learning more about how to help their children. And we continue to work on those, uh, on those three areas through our objectives. Some of the things that have been going on this year that I think are really important, uh, anti-bullying is one of the areas that we've really been it's looking at. It's a big at. issue for parents. Big staff, issue yeah. uh, at all levels. And we know for, through our adolescent health survey that it, it's an issue for students. Um, so our elementary schools, four of our elementary schools this year completed um, some a um, aggression reduction training through the Mark Center, which is a, a Massachusetts group that works with anti-bullying, which uh, really um, encompasses both bullying in a person-to-person -person concept, but also cyberbullying, which we see as emerging as a really difficult situation for our elementary, middle, and high school students. We also, at the middle school, have worked with the local youth commission, and they come in every year to do a cyberbullying workshop for our middle school students and provide information for parents around that. Another uh, an, an, an initiative this year, which I think is a really important one, is our middle school introduced an advisory program. And through advisory, we have established small groups of students, 12 to 15 students per advisor, and that would be a staff person at Pollard, who meet on a daily basis, develop relationships over the course of the school year, and really provide a safe, uh, good place where kids can eventually develop a relationship with that teacher or that adult so they feel connected and attached to their school, which we know is another one of our goals. We want all of our students to have an attachment at school to an adult that really can help them through the, the good times and the bad. Well, and regardless of their age, we've said again and again that there is nothing more important or critical, and frankly, I don't believe there's anything more important going on in this community right now than those connections that students mm -hmm. are making, individual students are making with their teacher in the classroom. That, that's just so fundamental and core to, to our mm -hmm. mission. Um, advisory homeroom, what's the difference? The, the middle school used to have homeroom. Mm -hmm. Um, now it has advisory. What's what's the critical difference between the two that they're trying to uh, unfold at, at the middle school? There actually yeah. is a curriculum that that supports the advisory situation. In homeroom, homeroom was is a check-in, an attendance taking time, announcements, business, business as yeah. usual. Advisory really is more focused on activities that the teacher might introduce. Not every day, but there is a curriculum that the teacher can follow that will. Uh, help kids learn problem-solving skills, um, develop ways of expressing their feelings more appropriately using words, really peer role modeling work goes on. It isn't at a, at a counseling level, but it is at this good teacher-student level that kids really can feel like they're, they're getting comfortable developing skills and learning something during that time. So now what about at the high school? And what, what challenges for the high school or even the elementary schools as we think about connecting kids to adults and their social and emotional health? Mm -hmm. At the high school, there was a series of freshman seminars this year run by the guidance department, which again happened in small groups. Uh, I, I believe it was in the homeroom group at the high school, but it was a, a series of, I believe, three seminars to help the freshmen get used to being at the high school, getting connected with people at the high school. Um, they're also, um, at the elementary level, we do have mentoring programs for, actually throughout the district we have a mentoring program for our, our Boston resident students, our Metco students, which uh, connects an adult in the district with each Boston resident student. Uh, there are different programs like that happening um, in all of our buildings at this point. Um, when I think about the work that you talked about regarding global uh, education and 21st century learning and supporting the social emotional well-being of our children, I realize that, and one of the, the new pieces to our goals this year that, that Tom and Ann have, have uh, really been critical to is thinking about our infrastructure. And there's no question that we can't do this work in the classroom. Teachers cannot be supported unless there's a, there's a human resource, a technological, and a finance system that really supports it. Otherwise, it, 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 it really collapses. And I think we spent a lot of time uncovering that and talking about that. Um, it would be, it'd be helpful to, to hear a little bit about some of the, uh, uh, some of the initiatives, Tom, and, and human resources that you've been focused on that have, that have taken off that support these initiatives going on in the classroom. Yeah, one of our big initiatives this year was around uh, looking at our substitutes <coughs> and how we were preparing our substitutes and how we were placing substitutes in the classrooms. There were uh, some days where we didn't have enough subs in the district to cover the vacancies, whether they were uh, staff members out sick or uh, out on professional development. 
So we formed a team of uh, substitutes, teachers, and myself, and we really spent a year taking a look at uh, how can we improve our substitute system. Uh, we looked at two uh, pretty significant areas. One was around training. Uh, we now have, for all of our subs, uh, a five-hour online training program that every sub is required to take, uh, particularly subs who have not been teachers. Uh, we don't require that of uh, former teachers or retired teachers, but folks who have not been in the classroom, this five-hour online training gives them really a terrific foundation and really a tool bag. So when they walk in the classroom, they're going to have some experience through this five-hour online training. The other area that we implemented this past March, we really spent the whole year uh, planning for it, was the implementation of a uh, web-based solution uh, to place our substitutes called ASOP. Uh, so teachers now go, uh, rather than to the phone and call a uh, sub-caller for their uh, absence, they go on the web and report their absence. And all of our substitutes, 24 hours, seven days a week, can go to that website and take a look at the vacancies and actually sign up for the teachers that are going to be out. It really has improved our efficiency in the classroom. Our fill rates are a little bit better than they've been in the past. Our substitutes are reporting that they far prefer planning out their week rather than getting the 5.30 a.m. phone call asking if they are available to sub that day. Uh, and it really has made uh, a nice difference in terms of the uh, uh, filling of our uh, of our substitutes in our classroom. Well, and it's a huge, it's a huge difference for the students who who have a little bit. It's a little bit more dependable right. for for their experience in the classroom. If teachers and substitutes are coming in prepared. One other additional thing is teachers now can attach their lesson plans to the web. So rather than a substitute walking in, and in 15 minutes trying to review the lesson plan, they can take a look at that. You know, a day before, or two days before, or a week before, depending on when the vacancy was. Uh, was posted and review the plans and they may even have time to contact the teacher and say gee I don't really quite understand number two could we spend five minutes talking about that so I think it's uh, you know it's brand new it's a learning curve but I think it's making a big difference in the system when you started at, in, in the Native schools a few years ago with with a, a few of us you came into the position as the director of personnel and very quietly and subtly you really evolved that into the director of human resources to me, there's a, there's a there's a distinction there in, in that it, it's uh, it's trying to find the right people um, for the classroom by way of substitutes for our children, but it's also trying to find the right people to lead our buildings and to lead um, our, our teaching and learning in the classroom. A huge amount of time has been spent on on, on uh, recruiting, uh, supporting our teachers. Can you share with us a little bit about some of those processes this past year? Because as you know. Many people comment to us on, on the thoroughness of our process, and it takes a while, but maybe you can share with us some of that your yeah, work in that area. Uh, it really is a very uh, thorough process that is very well vetted, and it, and it begins with sort of the recruitment. It's the advertising. It's uh, attending the job fairs. I've attended uh, you know, a dozen or so job fairs that are designed for teacher recruitment. Uh, and it begins with sort of pulling uh, candidates into the system, and principals and hiring managers uh, review candidates resumes and credentials. We last year launched an uh, online uh, application process uh, where candidates now post all of their materials, their application, their resume, their transcripts, their letters of recommendation online. So a principal can go to uh, the database 24 hours a day, seven days a week, Sunday afternoon, and really call out the folks that they want to pull in for an interview. And typically it's a search committee that will have the first interviews with candidates. That will result in a second interview that uh, often is bringing back a smaller number of candidates back into the district meeting with other people. For our uh, administrative positions, that includes a full day site visit to the Needham Public Schools, really giving them the opportunity to interview Needham, but allowing us to continue the interview of their candidacy. And I think it really creates uh, a great atmosphere of both, uh, sort of both sides of evaluating, is this a good fit? Uh, we then continue with a site visit. Uh, whether it's a teacher or administrator, we typically will go to their school uh, and either observe the teacher teaching or meet with a host of individuals who are f most familiar with that candidate's work. Uh, we uh, include the reference checks uh, along the way <coughs> and going back as far as we possibly can go. It's not just the previous job, but several jobs prior to, uh, to that. 
Uh, and then it's there that we then make the decision on our candidate. Um, our most recent hire was our director of athletics, and a small group of us traveled to Pennsylvania uh, to visit him at the Germantown Friends School. We think it's an important part of the process, uh, and it really has resulted in hiring uh, outstanding, highly, highly qualified administrators and teachers. We've done, uh, I think the district has done a superb job in hiring some really terrific people. Well, it's, it's, it's intense. It's uh, complex and multi-layered, what, what you've established. And as you indicated, technology has been a, a key piece of it because that's helped facilitate the work. But at, the, at, at its core, the development of human resources, which is what you've been focused on, has just been so powerful and, and, and terrific. And having been with you on that site visit to Germantown Friends School, there's no question that walking around that campus and, and talking to folks that uh, Micah Haubin, our new athletic director, um, interacts with, that really does help complete the, the picture. And um, But it, it's an, it, it takes a long time. It takes a long time. And, uh, it may be an imperfect process, but I think Needham, uh, through through uh, your leadership, has, has has made that happen well. And I think it, uh, with with the complement of technology, uh, really helps facilitate the work for all of us because we've all been you've been involved with hiring for literacy, and not only the director but a teacher. Um, you've been involved in hiring a new elementary special education director, all of whom we'll have to have on the show sometime next right. year. And 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 Ian, all of this is is is. Uh, been part of our goal around infrastructure, and that's really trying to draw out a technology plan that supports everything that we're doing in the classroom or in our offices. Um, can you share share with us uh, what was the impetus for this five-year technology plan and some of the major highlights of the plan? Well, I think sustainable operations is really one of the major impetuses of what we're all doing here, sort of with regard to learning and infrastructure, and that was really the impetus for the technology plan review as well. To um, make sure that the resources that we're applying to technology are really being used in the best and the best and most effective way possible. So instead of having a school department that is characterized by um, technology that is sort of a standalone application that people have to go to and um, use, it's now um, the goal is to have it more embedded in the curriculum, embedded in the learning opportunities, uh, to be a more interactive part of the classroom, Part of the new model that the technology plan um, is really focusing on is moving away from computer labs as places where people go to interact with computers and bringing that technology into the classroom uh, in the form of smart boards and interactive projectors, curriculum online, um, wireless access, laptop carts, um, things that allow tech kids and teachers to interact with the curriculum. Well, in, in the uh High Rock coming online, which is probably our most will be our most state of the art facility with a with a wonderful infrastructure for learning and, and laptops. That's another example of how the, the technology plan will uh, be manifest uh, in in that school. Uh, and part of what Tom was talking about and what he's been doing with human resources and and Terry, uh, you've been doing with Atlas and a curriculum database and and we do with special education in Eastbed. Uh, right? Uh, easy IEP. Easy IEP. Um, all of this technology is, is, some of it's removed from the classroom. It's allowing us to do things and manage the programs that we have. Um, what, maybe Terry, just briefly, what Atlas, which is a curriculum database, how, how does that tie into the technology plan and how is that helping facilitate the work we're doing in our, in our schools? Well, I think part of um, the technology plan is, is, is looking at how we communicate with each other effectively. And having curriculum in a place there that allows teachers to access their curriculum and to communicate with each other about teaching and learning and what's happening is really a, one of the uh, out, outgrowths of the, the um, recommendations that came forth from the technology plan. And what Atlas will allow us to do is not only um, put all our curriculum online and make it readily accessible for teachers, it will allow us to publish parts of it so that parents and prospective people new to the community will be able to see what's happening, uh, what the curriculum is, where things get taught in the curriculum. It'll also allow us to audit our curriculum much more effectively in the sense that we can look at how many times some concept is taught vertically throughout the years and if in fact we are uh, over teaching in some places and under teaching in others, it'll give us a good way of monitoring 
um, the overall programs that we're providing for our students. So if I'm hearing this right, then the technology plan really is not just about the computers in the classroom and the deployment of uh, instructional technology teachers in the classroom. It's really also about our information technology, our, our the tools that, that each one of you manages and, and uses to make sure that we support what's going on in the, in the schools and classroom. That's also an expensive proposition to have this rich, deep, complex uh, technology plan. And one of the things I know that you spent a lot of time on this past year is thinking about a five-year forecast for the schools so that we would have a look ahead at what Needham Public Schools budget and expenses uh, may be and resources over the next few years. That had not been done before. It was complicated. It required enrollment, uh, what revenue might be coming in, and a variety of different uh, data points. Can you share with us what did that look like? How did you get to that place with the school committee and, and what next steps might be for, for that? That's a lot. So why don't you tell us what the five-year plan is, first of all. Sure. Um, it was, again, we did it the first year this year, and really it was looking at all of the different trends and budget drivers that, that we all see come up every year and try to plot that out into a five-year plan uh, to figure out what the big picture really is sort of in the long term for the school department. Um, how does that big picture, how can it guide our resource allocation process, and then what can we learn from that to help us be a more sustainable operation? And what we really sort of learned, and really, it was really illustrated for us when we plotted all of these things out, was that we probably face a structural imbalance between the programs and the services that we um, are delivering and need to deliver in the future and the resources that are available for uh, to us to deliver those. Um, all of those things uh, are important and um, we have mandates, we have things that we must do, uh, want to do. Um, so what are the things that we can do in order to get us to where we want to go? And some of the things that we looked at in the, in the five-year forecast that we may need to do in the future that will alter the way we do things um, can be things like um, sort of a more cost-effective delivery of education, looking at opportunities for class size economies and different things that, uh, different ways of configuring classrooms uh, that deliver education in a more cost-effective manner. Um, sustainable salary growth, obviously we're a service organization and our number one expense uh, are the people that work in the school department. So how do we control those salary costs yet compensate people fairly and effectively and competitively? Um, conserving energy uh, and conserving our consumable resources. Um, uh, technology smart growth, what we were just talking about uh, before. Um, support services, looking at all the things that underpin our organization, transportation, um, special education, English language learner, uh, and then trying to build capacity in our school system for um, uh, sort of an investment in the future that will help us yield uh, return. So those are the sorts of things that we looked at in the model, and really uh, we'll be updating that again to um, help us inform the next five years. So it will, we'll, it will continue on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. You have a structure now in place, though, that, that will allow some of the numbers to be, to be plugged in. There is no question that it is going to be a challenge moving forward to sustain our present budget and growth. Is, is that fair to say? And is this, does this forecast give us some ideas of, of specific areas of, well, concern? And if so, what, what are they? Well, um, the number one, the most important asset of the school department are its people. And obviously, you compensate people with wages. Um, and that's, frankly, it's the a big driver. part of our budget. Yeah. Um, so that's really um, one way that we're going to have to look forward to keep ourselves sustainable in the future. We're going to have to figure a way and look at ways that we can compensate people, uh, yet um, help us to uh, control costs going forward. Technology, technology smart growth um, is another big factor. Um, we have had construction projects in the past that have allowed us to um, outfit our schools with state-of-the-art technology Placing and sustaining that technology over time is a big uh, is a big cost and a big challenge going forward. Um, I also would say that growing capacity is one of the other things that we need to do in the school department, and we've looked a lot at our people and how do we reconfigure ourselves and the way we support ourselves in order to um, uh, to help us go forward into the future. Well, and we'll have to do all of that interacting with the town 
uh, town side of government, which I think we've, we've really made some strides in, in achieving, and also working with the Finance Committee, the Selectmen, the School Committee, interacting, because there's no question the five-year plan is one thing and it's good to have, but the reality of our uh, fiscal climate and situation is, is really going to be a huge challenge moving forward. But I'm convinced that, that we'll be able to pull uh, the right people together as we have um, and certainly the leadership that all of you provide uh, will allow some good things to continue to happen. Um, one of the things that we didn't talk about, Terry, and, and I, I know we'll be short on time, but one of the other big pieces that occurred this past year, and I want to circle back to student learning, is that uh, we implemented a, a report card, a standards-based report card in the elementary school in uh, uh, third and third, third and grade, fourth. Third grade, piloted in Piloted in fourth grade. And uh, I know there's been a lot of conversation about that. It's been uh, reviewed by parents in the middle of the year. They provided some good feedback. And uh, we'll continue to refine that mm -hmm. and, and roll out more information uh, as, as that grows. So that is a, uh, a nice way to kind of conclude this conversation, thinking about how we're really trying to be focused on student learning and providing good information for parents so they have an understanding of what their children know and what their children can do. Mm -hmm. um, and that report card is, is a key piece of that. Uh, you know, I think lastly for, for the community, the this group of folks uh, that I'm with whom I'm speaking and all the principals and teachers and directors in the in the in the district uh, spend an awful lot of time on thinking about our goals and action steps we will share the, this document which is really a, a rich and a detailed document with the school committee it's available our uh, goal document online um, it will be discussed at the school committee and I think lastly it will be refined and we all play a role in that along with principals and, and teachers to see where we need to hone what we're doing focus some more, take out what is no longer appropriate, maybe implement something that we really uh, need to so that we can ensure that our students have a great education and need them. Thank you with all your work, with uh, the goals and everything that you do. Thank you. Thank you.